please, everybody is welcome. And Jude, could you describe what this particular session is going to be about more? Sure. Um, I think I can do that. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to start with a video. And um, as the description said, it'll be, we'll see what happens. I mean, I'm pretty much open to whatever. And Mark and, and, and Larry and I, Mark and and Larry and I have met several times uh, to discuss what might happen. So what we want to do is just show the video all the way through and then have a little bit of a whatever you want to call it. Some might call it a dialogue, some might call it a conversation, might call it a discourse. That's part of the conversation we've had and maybe we will love it. But I think that the emphasis for me would be on how do we have these cybernetic terms? No, these terms, these words come from a cybernetic point of view, so to speak. Is that possible? Do they mean something different? Does it require a different starting point? to understanding, understanding, or performance, or improvisation, et cetera, et cetera. And does that make a significant difference? That sort of emerged for me in our conversation in the video. Would Mark or Larry want to say anything? No, I, I think uh, many of us have been struggling with this vocabulary for, for many, many years, still see its value, so still want to struggle with it. And uh, looking for ways, to, you know, to talk uh, and interest other people. Okay, Mark. Um, yeah, I'm curious where there may be some um, some things from this video, which packs in a lot of people and notions and uh, sentences. Uh, what might um, relate to the the work that you all people on this call are doing or what might be in friction um and if something new may come out of that right and it is our desire to open a space for your participation along the way and let's start here would anyone like to comment who's in the room today before we show the video about what you want to get out of this or don't want to get out of it Susan, you're on mute. Mute, Susan. Susan you're, you're muted. <laughs> How do we tell her that? We can't hear you. I got it. Do you hear me now? Yes. La, la, la. Yeah, okay. I wanted to ask Larry, um, why did you use the word struggling with this vocabulary? Uh... I, I guess I use the word uh, because it comes from the experiences I have and talking, you know, with people, my friends, family, neighbors. Uh, and every once in a while, I see a, a point where I could use one of these words, but I don't know how <laughs> to use it such that it contributes to that conversation that I'm having at that moment with them. Uh, I, I, I think uh, that this vocabulary represents a, a, a different way of thinking uh, in that uh, it doesn't match up with the common everyday way of thinking that we experience uh, in everyday life. Thanks. I'd also just like to comment kind of as a pre preliminary that the title uh, enacting cybernetics, um, that is something that's been on my mind. Um, the, I, I do various things in my work um, that I consider enacting cybernetics or reflecting on my having been in the presence of and studied different uh, people in cybernetics and um, and then also wondering whether I ought to be presenting more of the framework from which I am, am doing the enacting. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's uh, there's it's a little bit of a private research in a certain way, um, but it has social consequences.
Can I make a comment, please? Please. I think most of us are educators, aren't we? And for me, in education, uh, everything is about cybernetics. Yeah. So we need uh, so. Uh, uh, so in 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 lear learning is an iterative process and circular uh, involves circularity you go forwards and backwards and so on and then you we need we all make use of this dimension of feedback yeah that i ask the students so how do you uh, so uh, getting some teach back? So what did you understand from what I what we learned earlier, what we did earlier, and so circularity and iterations and feedback and taking on someone else's or becoming aware that other people have different experiences and different perspectives, yeah, is in there as well. So this is this is for me uh, the most important concepts of cybernetics. And so we are, in, in a sense, we are already enacting it. That's what I wanted to say. Just having a conversation yesterday uh, in which uh, a friend of mine had, uh, asked me to read a chapter in a book. The book is called Fully Present, and the, it's about mindfulness. And I commented to him that I sometimes wonder uh, when what I'm reading or hearing is new or just common sense. And his response was, yeah, and that's what people say often about cybernetics. Hmm. Is it just about common sense? Is that what people say about I mean, I'm not quite no, clear. On. They wonder. They wonder. Well, it's about wondering. Because in, in many ways, cybernetics is about creating, designing, performing alternatives to the current common sense ideas that we embrace that are killing us. That's right. And I think that's part of why a lot of people are turned off by cybernetics, because it goes against their basic hegemonic ideas that are killing us. And that's a hard one to break. Claudia, did you want to say something? Claudia. Yeah, I I, I thought maybe I add, I, I've heard this comment before in regards to radical constructivism in when I was in Vienna and then this is like people were saying well that's nothing new it's just common sense I, so uh -huh. I've heard that I have I've heard that comment before and I thought about this for some time and uh, I think um, maybe it is common sense for designers but but obviously the um, the what is dominant theory is not you know it's not a design practice or you know science or uh, let's say the theory of life is not it's not taking these kind of insights into account. That's one thing. But then I would like to add um, to Michael and say, yeah, uh, and we, we see the, this focus on learning actually in Pasch and Maturana as well, this emphasis on, on, con on, on a conception of the human being as, uh, as a being that, you know, where the focus is on learning. So this kind of putting learning at the center is actually part of the idea of conceptualizing cybernetic terms, I think. I hand over because there are other hands. All right. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I would be very much afraid of is... This is, this is the systems community. 
Um, one of the things that would be hello, are you hearing me? I hear you, but I also hear another voice on occasion, and I'm not sure where that's coming from. It's not funny anyway. Um, one of the things I would be afraid of is to be commonsensical in the sense that I would be trapped and present in the idea that um, there is a way that is uh, supported by experience, etc. So continuously, whenever I um, engage with cybernetics, I have another question in my mind uh, at the same time, which is to what extent, um, looking from the outside, to what extent do I have any way of justifying uh, the concepts that I'm using? So mm -hmm. I know there is no answer to this, but I just wanted to uh, put it to me, to, to you. Yeah. Yeah. There is a way of thinking about and acting that is, um, in a sense, a double whammy. You think about the enacting, and at the same time, there is continuously this doubt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I hear. I think I hear that in, in a sense that, and, and often when I get into rooms like this, where there are people who study this thing called cybernetics, or practice it, or enact it, or think we do, is that I, I become aware that I really don't have the words to speak what I want to say. And um, that's the struggle for me in, in, in many moments is that they, you know, and, and, and for example, like for me, I want epistemology to mean I want, I don't want to control the world or anybody else, but this is what I want people to understand from my point of view, my epistemology, that epistemology can mean many things. And one of the things I want it to mean is that Everybody has one. And to me, that means taking, you know, what we call oh, other people have certain other perspectives or points of views. Or, but I have an epistemology. I have come to know what I know through my knowing and doing. And Gerard, when I reflect in that moment of doing it, then that becomes enacting cybernetics if we want to put a label on it. Um, and uh, but but I I struggle with with and I have since I met Herbert Brune, um, with with words, and and uh, describe what I'm trying to say. Pile. I think following directly on what you were saying, Jude, because the point I wanted to make is that there's reflection involved here. That when we reflect on what we're doing, there's a not just the common sense, but common sense made visible and reconsidered. It is through this point of stepping out of it and being able to think about it without necessarily having all the answers or all the words, because words, we make things of processes, of uh, qualities that as if they were things rather than qual happenings, but that's not. And, and that relates to me and the relate into the, one of the questions that's come up for me or emerged in this is in the sense of how do we turn objects into rhythms? Things into rhythms. And I'm very curious about that. Gary, did you want to say something else? No, uh, I don't want to say something else. Um, although I do want to say something else. <laughs> It's just my hand that I can't remove. <laughs> okay. Do you want to say something else anyway? No, not at this moment. Um, okay. I'm part of the question. Okay. <clears throat> Anyone else want to say something? Mm -hmm. Me? Susan? May I? Where are you? Go for it. All right. Um, Judy, this is to you, um, Jude. The comment you made previously about... Um, well, I couldn't discern whether you were complaining about something or boasting when you say that you don't have the words. I was reporting. But I still don't know whether it's a situation you want changed or a situation you want to aspire. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm struggling with it. I struggle with it because I can't find the right the words to mean what I want them to mean because they mean what they mean in, in the old paradigm view of that word. And that is not what I want. Right, but don't you, 
aren't you feeling the sense of being a playwright? I mean, this is the, the thing that I bump into all the time. It's the jubilation to discover that the language is insufficient. And then to search for the sufficiency, the broken language or the weird syntax. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have no problem with that. I, what I said hopefully doesn't go against that, but maybe there is an example of how the language I use didn't convey what I meant per se, at least not to you, Susan. Okay, but I guess the things that you were saying made me want to kiss and hug you and go, yes, comrade, we are struggling against a language which is, you know, which is justifying the unjustifiable, which is, um, you know, making important the things that should be left unimportant. We keep facing that language. And for me, that's been the constant offer of cybernetics is the understanding of the insufficiency. The understanding of the insufficiency and the desire to compose something different. Yes, yes. I, okay. I don't know if it would be sufficient, I can't say, right? Otherwise I would be doing what I'm against. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Should we watch a movie? <laughs> it's only eight minutes. Most of you, have, have most people seen this? I, I hope they have, but um, as I've, watch it, I see it different every time I watch it. Um, and deadlines are very good because they make you stop changing things. Okay, shall we? So any other comments before we start this part? And thank you for participating. All right, that's on. It's not a question of what things are. It is a question of how I learn. It is a question of when I can say something. And as we become confident of that, we, we stop being these outside observers, we, we stop being these controllers, and we start swimming in something which flows. So these conferences and meetings like this, each time regurgitate stuff, and next time, the next conference, it will be possible to say different things. There is always the idea of radical change. The radical change takes place in the mind. The problem is that we're still in the Shannon information age, which imprisons us in the past, because Shannon messaging means that you're going to send me something that I can already expect and all I have to do is figure out, did you mean this or that? That or that or that or that or that or that? But the Shannon model doesn't allow me to understand how I can know something new. And because all of the technology we're making is based on the Shannon model, messages that are expected, we are essentially screwing ourselves. So I envision a new kind of technology, a technology which helps us reach insights, not which helps us send messages. Sing it. The key for cybernetics is not the definition, it's about the vision for a different world. The late Amos Wilson said, if we desire a better world, we must name the world we desire. Desires. I was thinking that perhaps we should reflect on the nature of our problem. Problems are always conflicts of desires. So there is an undesirable present. How can one let the present transform itself into a more desirable. Desires. So if people don't know yet what to write in the desire assignment, they should simply sit down and think a moment what they want changed, and then make a statement as if the change took place. These are conditions that have to be met so that they can happen again. There are one description of life. One, not the only one, but one description of life is that needs to be met so that they happen again. If I could have sorted into the table of content the title needs, it would give us a different English language. 
He would understand, for instance, that we need peace. And since we need peace, we have to meet it with our conflicts. We have to meet it with our differences. Because we can only argue with each other when, when, when we are That is what I want. Every eye not only needs peace, but wants peace. So, asynchronicity is an invitation for generating newness through conversations that turns objects into rhythms. Provocative conversations. Provocative conversations. Provocative conversations. I claim that the priority of love is central because I claim that love is the emotion that constitutes the social. There is a fundamental difference in the course of human relations depending on the emotion under which it takes place. If it is love, it is the behavior, the action that constitutes the other as a legitimate other, inconsistent with itself. And the explanation of that phenomenon has to do with the possible history of recurrent interactions under which these systems drift together in coexistence if they enter in recurrent interaction without destroying each other. Now the beauty of it is that living systems are such that you can do this practically with all of them in the domains in which they exist, of course. If I want to live in relations that bring forth the legitimization of another in coexistence with myself. And want and need an honest language, then maybe the biology of love is an emotion that will invite a new honest language. We learn more about each other, you and I, and I of you. We learn how we not only agree about the nature of a couple of somewhat different oriented video cameras, but we also learn how we disagree. And in so doing, we learn about each other. People listen for understanding rather than agreement. So conflict is an invitation to turn. If you take together. each end carefully, and I'll get out of the way. Oh. Mm. Where did that come from? How would you undo that? You. How would I undo it? You. Yeah. Oh, I would take a, I'd take a scissors and I would go... Other than that, without cutting it. Well, let's see. If she hands it back to me, it might get undone. It did. Brilliant. Brilliant. So we can exchange back and forth. Thank we can so have a conversation much. where we exchange nodding. Exactly. Not exactly. You deal with the nod yeah. and through the conversation yeah. and going back and forth uh -huh. through conversation, the nod disappears. Maybe we're not doing uh, theory, but we're doing improv theater here now. Maybe yes. even some of us are not doing improv, but actually doing and acting based on the concepts of how the metaphors of cybernetics has affected my life and are performing daily life. Hopefully, in a way that might transform a conversation. Performance. Sharing your presence. Sharing your presence. Not the content, not the form, not the opinion. Just, I'm here. Sometimes it's done by looking at somebody. Conveying your thought and your attention. Not only one. Lou, thank you. Carrying your messages so that they reach out the way you want. Just one more question for now. I'm learning that I'm doing really cybernetic work. Now it makes sense, resonate, <laughs> but 
and then I think about it, oh, how does one work in cybernetics? Because the conference theme is uh, living in cybernetics, but I think it should be cybernetic. I mean, living is cybernetic. Mark? That was applause. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, while you're center screen, would you like to say something? Uh, yeah. Um, the the emphasis on learning that came up before looking yeah. at the video, and then um, the components of the video that uh, kind of were a reminder of um, acceptance of the other and um, disagreement um, kind of reminded me that um, in a society that has us going to schools, many schools and living in schools, uh, learning takes on a kind of an official uh, good value that one should have. Um, and that maybe leaves out the moments where we need to remind ourselves that maybe uh, learning maybe is difficult um, and is needed in certain places where it's excluded. So we think we're saturated with learning, but there's maybe less learning than <laughs> going on than we would are, are aware of um, and need to bring it into places. Like I was thinking, for instance, outside of the uh, academic situation is certain kinds of activist groups that I've been part of where some of them are trying to accomplish something, getting a message out. Um, there's uh, procedures and, and uh, practices that people are doing. And there's ones that take have learning as part of a necessary work. So that while it's trying to enact and act and um, protest or object, um, reminding the, the people, reminding themselves that something of what we're doing is a probe and trying to understand and, and learn something, find out something we didn't know before. Um, so that's one of the many things that this uh, video is reminding me of. Mark, could you give an example of that? Um, Oh, you know, one example is um, I, th I have been part of a group uh, called Community Court Watch, and it was addressing a specific problem, which is in um, a racist society, the criminal justice system is one of the reinforcers of racism, and that people who get caught up in the system feel isolated when they go to court. And so it's a, a small thing to take advantage of uh, the law that allows people to, to be present in court hearings for people with a friendly uh, approach to try to let the person not feel so isolated. Um, and as we do that, um, we're learning um, what that does for someone, because they will tell us, but also all sorts of aspects of what the system is that um, we feel is oppressive, but exactly how and what could be done about it is uh, constantly changing. So that group that I was part of um, would meet regularly and explicitly was saying, what are we learning? What, um, or I found out this thing last week and reporting that to each other. Thanks. I have a question for Judy. Um, what Ready. is it with the objects and rhythm? Yeah. So why are you asking, so how can objects become rhythm? So what, what do you understand under object? And why should it become a rhythm? Yeah, I asked myself that question as well. <laughs> and um, I feel like this is the kind of group of people I would like 
to talk about that with. Uh, the, the terminology that, by the way, that piece was actually provoked by Susan Parente a few years back uh, when we were at a school for design society where she was using the word perturbation uh, to describe something that went against my understanding of the word perturbation. So it ended up being a small piece that I put together uh, as a consequence of that. And I was also working on this in that Pedretti video, 50 minute piece that I was working on at the time. And she uses the term turning objects into, into rhythm. rhythms in her presentation when illustrating the recursiveness in a non-living system, which is when you point a video camera into a monitor and what emerges, which is really quite interesting. And talked about at that moment of, of, of illustrating that then went to this being about turning objects into rhythm. So, so Michael, thanks, because I'm very curious myself. And Susan, thanks for the provocation that allowed me to de develop what I would call provocative perturbations. I, I have an interest in this uh, as well. Uh, Thank you, Larry. Could, could we share the screen with everybody other than me? Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, in 2009, uh, Humberto Maturana sent a letter to the American Society for Cybernetics. Uh, it was while he was accepting uh, the the uh, uh, the Wiener, the Norbert Wiener Medal. He couldn't be there in person. And in this letter, he proposed zero time cybernetics. In other words, a look at the world not as objects and as causal relations among those objects which requires the concept of time, but rather as patterns, patterns of dynamics. And right. so when we think objects and we think causality, how can we still, how can we approach that and say, okay, there's another way to think. There's another way to think about the world and what's happening and how to intervene in it. And that's where my interest is. Could you say more? Uh, could you say more? I, I would like to say something a second. Um, Larry, I, and I, I might be wrong on this, but I, I need clarification or it might provoke a conversation. Um, I don't remember Maturan talking about zero time cybernetics. I do remember him talking about zero time. Yeah, and no, I, I make a distinction between zero time cybernetics and zero time. Yeah. Now he proposed a, a zero time cybernetics. Okay. And, I have to so, yeah. Okay. But I and, but I agree with zero time cybernetics. But to me, zero time is is the presence, the dynamics, which is unexplainable. It's the experience itself. And then when you add this thing that we humans live in called languaging, then zero time cybernetics emerges. So and unfortunately, that's been about objects rather than this idea of patterns that connect, the rhythms and the patterns that connect. Susan, well, did you want to say something? I just want to say that Claudia had a hand up and Goran had a hand up too. So I just want to recognize Oh, okay. Yeah. Before Susan, okay, Claudia. Sorry, I've talked before, so you could type. Oh, anyway, so I might get short. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm not sure about the term zero, zero time. I, I know I've been trying to get my head around this idea uh, before because it's not definitely not rejecting performativity that would be totally against Maturana. Uh, I mean, he would be arguing against himself. That's not what it is, is about. So um, I think it's, it's, um, it's an idea of emotionality in presence that um, that that de-emphasizes the idea of historical time. That's that's a, a something, a kind of linearity. Um, 
the idea of rhythm, I, I, I could try and attempt an explanation. It's obviously the, the objects, the idea of an object introduces an entitative bias and, 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 and pushes thought towards ontology away from something one could po possibly call zoetology. That is, for example, Roger T. Ames would, would use that term, something that is like a, a philosophy of life. And, and we see this in Maturana coming up again and again, this idea of an entitative bias. And, and when we think Maturana in the, uh, in, in the context of design, for example, I would talk to my students and I would um, suggest that they talk, think rather in terms of processes and verbs and gerundiums rather than in nouns. And with this, I hand over to Goran. Thank you so much. This is a fascinating conversation and a beautiful video. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and, a, and a wonderful provocation and a question as well uh, in, terms of, in terms of how we perceive that. When I think of the objects and what objects are and turning them into rhythms, this has curiously been a kind of a, a point of philosophical exploration and theory making, I guess, for the last decade or, or two in various fields where objects have been sort of rethought or there has been an attempt to rethink what objects are. And it's interesting to see how this shows up very early here in this community in the history of cybernetics. Um, and at least to me, it, it seems like an invitation, this invitation towards rhythms. It seems to me as a kind of a turn away from the, the classical um, where we might have perceived objects as sort of very stable. It, you know, when we think of objects, we think it's something stable. And rhythm seems to be really quite the opposite, sort of thinking of what Claudia sort of talked about dynamics, uh, more like a system of relationships uh, in a Maturana sense, uh, where, where dynamic relationships are defining it. And this to me seems to be more like a turn towards the quantum physics and sort of alternate perceptions of what objects are made of and moving more in the direction of fields, as it were. May I ask another question uh, while I've got a talking stick? You don't have to ask if you want to ask another question. You can just ask another question. It's a Thank waste you. of language. <laughs> Thank you. Well, actually, my question is about language. It's it's actually for Paul and for whoever else would like to comment, because I really love that uh, observation about Shannon. I've never quite perceived Shannon <laughs> in that. Uh, well, Paul's comment in the video about the limitations of Shannon's model. And I, I wonder if Paul might wish to share a little bit more about that and, and whether, you know, that it might, whether that might in some way relate to sort of the frustrations with language that you were describing, uh, Jude and, and that others sort of spoke about, um, and whether this, this notion of codification that's been so important, I guess, to the scientific tradition and the enlightenment in some way might be a source of limitation we kind of viewed from the sort of encoding things before we put them into a channel, pushing them through and, and having some assumptions. Uh, I wonder if Paul might wish to comment on that or anyone else. Great segue, Paul. Oh. Thank you, Goran. Um, the Shannon model, as I think you know, is the idea that you have a channel. Think telephones, because that's where he started from. Although we had a lot of discussions with Wiener and some prefer to call it the Shannon Wiener model of information rather than just the Shannon model. So you have messages coming in here and it's encoded in some way and it goes through this noisy channel and then it's decoded and then the hearer hears it. And the difficulty is that it assumes in its very mathematics that the hearer knows what messages could be coming. And the challenge of the channel designer is to put in enough redundancy such that if there's a lot of noise, 
that the message is repeated enough times such that the person at the other end can say yes, oh, that was an A and not a B, C, D, E, F. So there's the presumption that you know ahead of time what all possible messages are. Now, to my chagrin, there are lots of people, including in design, who say, oh, this is a great model. Let's use this to think about conversation even. But the Paskian model is very different and is all about, as you've heard, about learning and understanding and the emergence of meaning, or as Maturana would say, the message coming is not information itself, but rather triggers in the listener what's already in the listener's mind, forgive the metaphor, to make meaning. So the human makes meaning as a trigger, not because the information is in the sentence or the gesture or the dance or the language, whatever it may be. So I, I'm not, Goran, is that enough to explain what I meant? I'm not willing to weigh in on whether or not this applies to the context that people are talking about here. I'd rather others who thematically have created the event uh, take it from there if they wish to. Absolutely. Thank you. And it very much seems to connect to, to these notions of building peace that we see in the video that Drew talks about, the invitations of presence from Brune and, and others. It's fascinating. Um, Paul. I see this as a segue into also talking about not only the shining, which I consider communication uh, as a shortcut, forgive me for the metaphor, um, Fair enough. but uh, into this whole idea of conversation age that we need to go. I think this is brilliant. We need to go from, and I think this totally relates to that chat box thing, but you know, we need to go from communication into age into a conversation age. And um, for me, this opens up an opportunity for you maybe to speak a little bit about conversation age. And for Larry then to follow that up with a little bit about conversation theory or asynchronicity in relation to conversation, if that's okay. I'd rather jump right to Larry. Okay. And, and let, you know, it might be helpful for people to have a little, but basically you're saying conversation is what allows for insights to emerge. And that uh, this is a technology is that's it, necessary. And, and other things as well, but yes, Larry. Okay. Let me use, it, yeah, let me use an example. Uh, Gordon Pask uh, uh, had a residence at the university I was at, Old Dominion University, uh, back in 1988 and 89. Uh, Old Dominion University, and in particular the program that I was uh, chairing at the time, uh, was was getting into a, a video learning, two way a two way audio, one way video, real time. And Gordon was very interested in this, and uh, we talked, and I explained how you know this is, you know, we're doing it, but it's just difficult. It's not what I really want. And he said, well, you know, what you want probably can't be done here, but what, because in order to do what you want to do, you need an infinite <laughs> channel capacity. And we have very, very finite channel capacity with television and audio. And, uh, uh, but I said, what you can do is uh, to present in video, in a way that stimulates, perturbs, provokes, uh, triggers an individual at the other end to have a conversation with themselves. And you do that, he, he used the word entertaining. He said, you do that by entertaining. And, uh, and this is a very different idea because we're still talking in a sense about information and learning and, and so forth. But we're now talking about it, not in the sense of Shannon information, we're talking about it in a sense of that kind of interaction that we can have when we're face to face, and what we when we're not face to face, what can we do instead? Uh, uh, he, he used the term Petri information. I'll just throw that out there without talking about it. But just there is another there is another way of, look, of, of talking about information that incorporates Shannon, but is 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 it goes well beyond it. Uh, so yeah. Um, anything he, he looked at learning as a creative activity that every every act of learning I, you might want to say deep learning because 
some people will use learning to talk about, you know, memorizing something and regurgitating it. That's not what he was talking about. Talking deep learning is a creative act. And in a creative act, the insertion of information at that moment is infinite. Uh, and, and that's something that, of course, Shannon information can't handle. I'd like to offer a very small thing, mostly small because I, I don't want to distract from the direction the conversation's doing. So I think it's it's quite interesting. Um, I guess when I hear this idea about turning objects into rhythms, I think of the fact that that's actually what is always happening. When people hear something being said, what they hear is the thousands of times it has been said before. But we focus on the content and we don't focus on the rep rep repetitivity of what's happening with someone. So in a certain way, Jude, I want to say, unfortunately, we have turned objects into rhythms. The wenness of something said, people almost never bring that up. I always want to say, particularly about climate change activism, I'm going to say something to you and you probably have heard this a million times. And that is not an unimportant phenomenon. So I don't want to distract, but I, I do want to point out that um, Jude, what you, you want to have happen, frighteningly has been happening. Well, I would say it hasn't happened in the way that I want it to happen. Okay. And that, that would lead me to the importance of establishing what I desire so that I might generate rhythms that uh, reflect my desires as I have articulated them, um, which I see as different as goals. So yes, that you know, and, and some might call them cliches, but you're talking about it or 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 uh, there's a whole thing on the in New York Times today, I don't know if you saw it in the in the in the op ed section. It's nothing but cliches. It's completely ridiculous, but interesting. Um oh, okay. anyway, yeah. Thanks. Do we yeah. want to talk more? Do we want to talk more about conversation? Did somebody want to say something? Yeah, yeah. I'd like to. Let me throw Mark. something in. All right, throw it. One way to think about what Susan suggests is that um, the already turned into rhythm objects are actually turned into a particular kind of rhythm, which is mm -hmm. as repetitive and well known as any cliche. And the alternative that you're looking for could be thought of as rhythms that don't fit into that and that ebb and flow in proportion. And um, actually, I think that might be related to what Mark Enslin um, was alluding to when he referred to enacting cybernetics, since it seems that that is in some ways connected to performing rhythms that activate choices related to cybernetic thinking and choice. Thank you. Please don't ask me to repeat that. <laughs> repeat that, please. <laughs> you couldn't if you wanted to, because there is no repetition, only insistence. Ah. Gertrude Stein. I wish sure. she was an optimist. Well, you gotta be. <laughs> There's Garrett with him. We'll make some there, there. <laughs> right. There, there now. Go ahead. Anyone else want to? you're on mute. Who is it? Thank you. <clears throat> uh, okay. I'd like to make a comment on. Um, uh, this notion of uh, conversation, innovation, etc. One of the things that is emphasized in cybernetics um, is that there is a process of um, uh, reinforcement, a loop, um, and that is, of course, in itself a process. So in cybernetics itself, there is an element where there is both an object and a process. 
And the difficulty, of course, is that when we look at uh, these processes with the traditional forms of science, we treat both as objects. So mm. that is, of course, has, of course, been precisely the notion why a conversation came in, because when there is a cyclist causality or there is a feedback system, then obviously you cannot step out of that process. Whereas every time you want to do a conversation, the main point is that it's only interesting if the other person is stepping out of the process and saying something which to you initially sounds like a chaos. <laughs> um, so the interesting thing is that the second order of cybernetics is in fact already an attempt to introduce uh, the study of processes uh, rather than the study of objects. This of course has been a very, uh, is, a, is a long development. Uh, it didn't start with Descartes, but it did start with Kant. Uh, the first attempt to identify that knowing about process is a bit different from knowing about objects. So maybe <clears throat> there is already the seed of controversy and of unease and of struggling, et cetera, et cetera, in cybernetics itself with its combination both of objects and processes. That's my contribution. Um, conversations seem to be a little wider to, or it are more than just languaging that the conversations have within them what Maturana would speak of as emotioning but I would like to invite us to think of as more broadly as a systemic engagement with a variety of things that we have not actually distinguished in language but are happening in the dynamics of the engagement. That's why I like the word engagement. When we get into language, we have difficulty speaking of these things. And I think of patterns. Uh, they have an implicit uh, repetition in space, and rhythms have an implicit repetition in time. And yes, there are recurrences, but the recurrences are in all situations have to be new because every recurrence will have changed the perceiver of that recurrence to some minor degree at least. The, so we are, as Maturana also said, we detect nervous system is a detector of configurations within itself. So maybe the word configuration is another one, but maybe a dynamic configuration. Excuse me, Pile, but there's somebody who needs to mute themselves because it's interfering with, with your comments. Thank you. I think I think I've come to kind of the end of it, my part anyway. At least the flow doesn't seem to have a next place to go. And flow is, I think, an interesting word as well, because there is a, a flowing of doing things where the flow is directed in part by what came before, what's happening at the moment, but it doesn't necessarily have. It's not a thingness. It's not, and it's not a noun, although we even make <laughs> our, our verbs into things as if they were objects. It's, it's an ongoing puzzle for me to think about languaging and, and engagement. I was asked to teach a class this last two semesters <clears throat> on post-performance dialogue. And there are uh. Uh, models and procedures and practices that one can offer for someone to answer the question how to do this, um, but it is not doing it. Um, and so I found myself withholding or just not getting into models with the students who found that a little disorienting at first. But I started off by showing this short video that's on YouTube of Maturana speaking for two minutes about his uh, learning to fly. And he talked about um, getting into the glider with the teacher sitting behind him and 
as he is <laughs> uh, flying, the teacher just alternating three words uh, saying, good, 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 relax, relax, coordinate, coordinate, good, good. Um, and this video is a, to me is an illustration of how um, someone might identify some objects, but it's really a rhythmic event that's happening. Nice example. Other comments? I think that that also could be used to get a line on Maturana's comment about zero time cybernetics, um, which I understand to actually not be a negation of time, but a negation of a particular kind of time, which I call clock time or mechanical yeah. time which is imposed on the flow of events. But there's another concept from ages of ago that seems to me might have something to contribute to cybernetic thinking, which I would call paratactic time. Mm -hmm. And those are temporal relationships that are connected across um, frameworks that are not discrete and linear. I think this sort of connects to what Claudia was suggesting too. Could you say more about this paratactic time? So, um, yeah, which this semester I taught with a person in theater, a course on nonlinear approaches to composition and our alias for that long phrase was uh, paratactic composition. And so this goes back to some things that came out of uh, work that was done in, with various people here, touching on parataxis as an alternative to syntax, um, AKA sequential relations, which determine the significance of elements in the sequence and the identity of the sequence. So parataxis in general has to do with creating orders that where sequence doesn't determine the meaning of everything. Nice. Like in language where, uh, you know, noun is determined by a position of a word phrase in the sequence of the sentence, the verb, et, et cetera. But paratactic, um, some people compare it to structures where um, it's kind of a dangerous metaphor, but so are all metaphors. Um, <laughs> folks of a wheel where each... Uh, spoke could be seen as a consequence of a premise, but the uh, consequences don't lead to one another. Another image is a theatrical work or a film that does not, it isn't based on a sequential plot structure. So paratactic often means networks of meaning that are not determined, where the sequence isn't the most important part of them. You could start at one place and go to another. Uh, recently looked at a large wall scale photograph with some students and asked, does this piece have a beginning? And the general thought was, not really in the conventional sense, you can enter wherever you want to enter and travel through the network, but how you travel is not dictated by starting at a certain point and ending at another. So I hope that's not too long and I hope it's adequate. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think uh, Donna Haraway's thinking with would go into the same direction, just to add, um, like thinking things with other things, like placing them side by side. Can you uh, unpack that a little bit? Donna Haraway has developed on the idea that we need to, that how important, uh, has like emphasized how important it is that we 
that we look at how we think things in the context of other things. But I think it, her idea of thinking with goes really a little bit above the idea of context. It's something to kind of, she describes this as holding one thing and kind of making it meet the other thing at the same time. So that's also, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's also an attempt, as I see it, to eliminate this all kinds of linearity and of fixed hierarchies and to but but be really um, considerate about the the context in which we think things thanks Your use of the word context just gave me a little smile and recognizing that the etymology of that word must mean with text. So the whole idea of a context probably did not arise until we were doing things with text. So that reminds me of the huge difference in our thinking that must have happened as we moved from oral only language to written language. and the kinds of uh, permanence that seems to arise when we write things down. The objects seem to have more substantiveness once they can be written and reused as text. There's a moment in the video um later on when uh herbert brune is talking about uh desires and there's this uh desire exercise that's spoken about um mm -hmm. and as far as i understand the this came from a class that he taught with heinz von forrester in 1968 where the first, it was a heuristics class. And the first assignment was to write a list of uh, statements about which you would say, while it is not the case, I desire it to be the case. Um, and that the students were encouraged not to be, to appeal to reasonability. Um, and the little bit in the video is, seems to be his commenting on some difficulty that people had in doing this. And so he tried to describe a process of how he would do this writing. Um, and having um, sponsored and played around with this process for a long time, I've come to see that the, the part where um, I think Jude's text talks about turning desires into false statements and something that, that Bruin would talk about also was that um, the the invitation to, to say something wrong or false um, seems to be um, a kind of a provocation to novelty or to doing something that's not uh, part of the expected um, along the lines of what uh, Paul was talking about, um, the op opposition to the Shannon model. Um, And there's yeah. something why I'm bringing this up now. I... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I see that too, very much related to um, if this idea of Maturana is that, that our problems are consequent, always related to a conflict of desires. You know, I, if that's the case, if we really want to generate social transformation and conspire with one another in order to do so, then we need to know what our desires are. And we need to be able to create a space to have conversations about our desires 
and I mean deep conversations where differences can emerge and we can work through those differences in a loving, supportive way. And I think that's something we have a really hard time with in the variety of different social movements I've been involved in. You know, there always seems to be a falling out or, you know, where people just can't go to that deep space of conversation. Well, I wonder if it's uh, allowing them to be objects rather than rhythms. Say that again, Mark. I wonder if it's a consequence of um, treating the statements as objects rather than as rhythms. Could you say a little more? Um, well, you know, you invoke desires um, and now the desires are, are named and they can have conflicts with each other. Um, and then once you've stated a desire, you're held to it um, and it, it obscures that it came out of a process and is in a process. Um, but that's not the way I see it at all. I see it now how you see it as objects, but for me, it would be more like once you're in a space where you have this generosity of living in mutual respect and, and an understanding that difference and disagreement are an opportunity to generate insights we can share, then I don't, I, I don't see my desires as possibly being fixed, but that a more actually better desire might emerge when you and I conflict over our desires. And maybe that's the rhythm of, of, of that happening. And, and for me, the deep conversation allows those rhythms to emerge, might allow those rhythms. How can desires conflict? Well, look around in the United States of America. I've been looking for 30 years and I <laughs> definitely don't think it's because there's a conflict of desires. But rather? Um, there's any number of things and I guess I would go back to the difference between conflict and contradiction. And I desire abortion to be illegal. Uh, so do I. No, I don't, really. <laughs> but there are people who desire that. Um, well, so I think this would probably lead into a description of how you're articulating the desire. And one thing that you just alluded to is the search for a point of view in which we could fulfill right. our desires. And in that right. sense... Right. What prevents desires from being fulfilled relates to power and violence. Right. It, it, it relates to us not having things. the ability to sit down and have a conversation in a nonviolent way so that we might work through and come to some resolution. Right. But it that's not a conflict yeah. of desires. That's a, that's a systemic conflict. It's not a conflict of desires. Well, we disagree. Uh, that's what we were hoping, right? Right. <laughs> so what is a systemic, Sullivan, what is the distinction between conflict of desires and a systemic conflict? Um, I think I would refer to systemic conflict as a conflict that comes from the structure and dynamics of the system that can be acted on in a way that ignores articulation of desire. Mm. So if it were not possible to manipulate people's ability to meet their needs, um, the discussion about desires would be radically different because desires would be fulfilled yeah. um, and needs would be met. Yeah, 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 yeah. But right now people, People speak about things that are functions of power and violence as if they were functions of desire. This is one we of those false statements Ensign wanted to elicit. So I never thought about claiming that 
desires can't conflict, but it sounded like an interesting false statement. So uh, Mark, are you talking about uh, conflicts between different ways of thinking as opposed to actual individual desires? I was thinking about that comment from uh, Maturana in the video where the context he makes a statement about uh, problems coming from conflicts of desires. Um, and, you know, now under this conversation, I'm thinking of it as uh, um, an expression of a desire is an expression of uh, a view of the world. Um, and that um, the the views of the world being expressed might not match. <laughs> and, um, right. And yes, it is systemic. No, no question about that. But that doesn't prevent me from wanting to change it. Elena says in the chat, some conflicts agree on ends, but not means, such as both parties wish to be comfortable, but one likes the room to be warmer than the other. Others seem to rely on definitions, such as the anti-abortionist believing a fertilized egg to be a full human being, while others believe full personhood depends on viability. So I guess I'm going back to, to the notion that conflicts can be resolved in the system in which they're seen as occurring, and contradictions can't. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I that, that, that point I understand, Mark, uh, in the sense that, yes, um, I would agree that, that I would hope that, that that's a very interesting point, because um, I, too, agree with the idea of uh, conflicts are something that can be resolved within a system, whereas contradiction requires a change of the system. And uh, yeah, that's a good point. And then you bring in that whole idea of the system of, of power and, and, and oppression and although I still see that conflicts can be conflictual and they can be contradictional as well, maybe. I'm not so sure about that. That would take a conversation. So Sullivan, one more question. How would you connect what you're saying about the distinction between conflicts and contradictions with what you were saying with um, paratactic time? Mm. Whoa. Well, I mean, that, be that's a delicious question. <laughs> um, hmm. So I think that a lot of discourse about social transformation um, gets bogged down. And maybe this is where what Jude was alluding to, things falling apart, um, in the desire for either a guaranteed sequence of events or a high likelihood sequence. And I think Thinking paratactically would allow for thinking of certain kinds of transformation to occur um, at different points in time, which is back to the notion of rhythm. So it doesn't have to be all marching from the exposition to the development to the conclusion. We might have some things that happen much later and can't be carried out in the beginning of the process. So I think imagining processes with uh, different ebbs and flows and different proportions would be a better model for how to approach social transformation than something that's based on linear stepwise development. And that's just a beginning sort of off the top of whatever. I don't even think it's coming off the top of my head, but. <laughs> no, it's not. It's another one of those cliches. What? <laughs> on the top of the head. <laughs> Out of the top of my head. I would like to add a comment. 
bottom of While my we are sitting here, lots of young people are actually experiencing social media, the internet, and uh, for example, YouTube as really honestly transformative tools. There are so many young adults that have begun years ago making their little videos and through that being exposed to the opinions of so many other people and they got I think into a deep reflective mode and I, I, I don't have a lot of examples for this <laughs> but yeah so if we so and I think it's some we've the revolution that the internet we hoped for would cause I don't know 25 years ago is perhaps happening now with another generation so th that's my observation that I wanted to share that there really something is happening maybe not with everyone but they are it it is happening yeah Larry well I think there's always something happening uh, question is, is it happening within the constraints that we want? Mm. Mm -hmm. Larry is, or Mark, is there anything in particular? We've got about 10 minutes left. Is there anything you would like to comment upon? Or There's a hand up, Judy. Oh, okay. Judy. Jerry. I don't see it. Just Jerry Chandler. Uh, yes, uh, Jerry. Jerry Chandler from here. Uh, I just make a, a general comment. The conversation and the movie uh, are very uh, stimulating to uh, follow, but I uh, find the course of the conversations uh bounce like uh a rubber ball between different sections of my mind and these bounces are tied to different reference systems different meanings of terms different interpretations of either myself speaking for myself and of myself and of my beliefs versus or in in contrast or in context with what the general public uh, may have in terms of interpretation of these terms, interpretation of these bounces, interpretations of these languages, interpretations of these logical terms. And this uh, uh, situation uh, is something that I would think people in second order cybernetics, and, and I'm not a cybernetician, by the way, but I be, think the people in second order cybernetics really ought to take a serious look at the role of the individual uh, in creating their view of second order cybernetics. Uh, and I, it seems to me that the one aspect of this that is consistent among almost all of the speakers is that they sort of take the reference system of first order cybernetics as the baseline for what they expect for second order cybernetics. That is some sort of perfect communication system where messages are transferred precisely and exactly and temporally and time and that they are meaningful messages because they can be translated back into the original encoded concept or encoded message. And so I'll, I'll stop there, but I do see this as the uh, linkage of some form or another between the entire conversation here is this idealization of first order cybernetics as being foundational to uh, human communication. And I, I think that is a, a very serious error. Jerry, do you have an example of that? I don't see it that way, and I don't I don't know what you mean. Uh, I, yes, I think the example, simplest example, 
Paul, is the example between the role of physics in developing a view of society and the role of, say, molecular biology in developing a, a role for the society of molecules in living organism. In the former case, things are taken as independent messages. And in the latter case, there's already a relativity among all the individual molecules within the individual human being. I hear that example, but I, I was asking for one, sorry, I wasn't clear about our discourse here. You were saying our discourse here is rooted in first order. Well, I think that that's the shadow reference behind what I see this bouncing ball as my, as my mind tries to de develop the order of these concepts or the disorder of these concepts. Uh, as I try to interpret, it may only apply to me because of the languages I speak. And it may right. not apply to other people with other languages who have a great coherence in their own mind about how the yeah. world actually works. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd have to admit that I feel like this was a conversation where if you weren't familiar with the history of the conversations in the American Society for Cybernetics, that it would be difficult to grasp what people were saying. I, I, I totally can relate to that because I think this was a deep, not a deep conversation, but, but a dialogue in which a lot of those traces were important for people to establish connections. So I apologize if we were to whatever. Well, no, I, think you've missed, I think you've missed my point. Uh, I, I really do. I've been following cybernetics conversations now for nearly 30 years. Well, you told me you don't know cybernetics, and you weren't. Into I, no, I said I'm. I said I'm not a cybernetician. There's a oh. big difference. But I've been following cybernetics okay. conversations for thirty years. Okay. Well, I don't. I, I. I. would have to agree with Paul in the sense that um, you know, there's no point in disagreeing. I, I appreciate your comment, and I will reflect upon it. However, I disagree with it. Uh, Other if comments. I could... Yeah, if I Larry, could. Larry, uh, please. Um, uh, I think what Jerry says is an, uh, uh, a description of the struggle that I talked about. Uh, when I view the video, when I apprehend this discussion that we have here, I find myself having to do so paratactically mm -hmm. and that's not for me yet comfortable uh but yet i think that's at the moment where i need to go and uh so i thank mark for bringing that in there <laughs> i don't well, understand that, no. so larry why do you say that if it's necessary to view the conversation through the paratactic concepts. It makes you uncomfortable. What What is it that explains? No, no. Oh, well, it, the, the discomfort is it actually, uh, maybe that's the wrong word, uh, but it's not what I was trained for. It's not how I've been brought up. It's not how I was educated, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, I, I, I find myself needing to do it and, and I'm enjoying doing it. That's why I'm here. Uh, uh, but it forces me to, to look at things rather than in a linear progression, a linear, linear logical progression, one idea to the next, to look at them, this idea, then this idea, and this idea, and this idea, and we keep working with it, we keep having the conversations, and at some point something comes out that's of interest, that's uh, new, that's contributive. It is about 1.30. It's 1.20 now. Um, Mark, since you were <laughs> one of the moderators of this, or whatever you want to call it. Oh, you mean? Do, would you like to say something, Mark uh, Enslin? Yeah. yeah, it seems to be that a difference comes about not only from what we say, but when we say it. <laughs> here, here. When man. and how? Mark, uh, the other Mark, did you want to say something? So, I think Larry just called up an interesting aspect of thinking about social transformation mm -hmm. and aiming at a next present, 
which is <laughs> what if there's more than one and that we're aiming at various points to come and they aren't necessarily following following one another in an order that we can currently predict. More than likely that's the case, huh? Seems, but that's an interesting thing to try to conceptualize, especially in terms of a conversation. Yeah, I, and the question then is, okay, what do we do? And I think, <laughs> and what, it, what I've been advocating for for 30 years, is to look at the constraints mm. and change them if we can, uh, or reconceptualize them. So that also suggests we might project temporality into provisional real-time unfolding constraints. Yes. Ooh. That. <laughs> Well, maybe this is an example of that. <laughs> I'd like to thank everyone um, for participating and attending. <laughs>